Okay, well, um, I'm Stuart and he's Roger. Yeah. Uh, what we're going to do is we'll start off with Roger who will talk a bit about um, the hoverflies, what they are, the sort of diversity biology of them, and a bit about the recording scheme that the two of us and some others run to actually collect records. Then I'll take over and I'll talk about some of the things you can do with those records. So, Roger. Okay. Um, we, um, we've been running this scheme now for 26 years and are getting to the point where it's about time someone else took over. It could be you. But only if we enthuse you enough. So my job is to try and infuse you to think that hoverflies are actually the best thing since sliced bread. Now, sliced bread I wouldn't touch, but hoverflies are great things. I've already done that. You've done it. Good. <laughs> They're all here. Right, let's give some context. You know what a fly is. Two wings, pair of whole tiers, zip around, the most agile things under the sun. From our point of view, they're actually some of the most interesting animals going. You want to think a little bit about a fly or any insect, we've got to think more about what their larval stages do rather than what the adults do. So, for example, you hear a lot about things like pollinators. Yes, they're terribly important, but I'm going to show you a little bit about what hoverflies do that actually make them incredibly important as ecosystem regulators. They're part of the order Diptera. Um, worldwide, the order Diptera is pretty substantial, 160 odd thousand species, 154 families. But if you actually think about that, the numbers that we're talking about there are actually pretty small. In the British Isles, we've got now 7,141 species in 106 families. When I started in Diptera back in, oh God, 1983, I should think we were looking at about 6,500 6, species. We've added six, 700 species to the British list in that 30 years. More now, like 5,000. More like 5,000, was it? Oh, right. Well, the first time I looked at the list was probably... So there you are, 1,500 species in that time. 2,000 species. The numbers, therefore, worldwide are probably much, much bigger. So that 160,000 is just skin the surface. If you want a research area, Diptera are pretty good because there's so much out there to learn. Huge taxonomic challenges, then even hoverflies are not terribly easy. When I started hoverflies, they were regarded as pretty difficult. They're still not easy, but life is a lot easier. So the family Surfidae, i.e. hoverflies, uh, known in America as flowerflies, for the obvious reason that a lot of them visit flowers, um, worldwide, 6,008 species that we know about. But there's a genus out in South America called Copestylum where the estimates are there could be as many as 3,000 species in one genus. Incredible radiation. Europe, 829 species, and the British Isles, 283 species at the moment. I've got one species still to write up. I must get that job done before Easter. Just to give you an idea, that's what's happened to the British list in the last hundred years or so. What you can see is pretty well a constant state of increase. Now that increase derives from a number of things. Firstly, we've seen huge changes in our understanding of taxonomy. A lot of things have been split. Certainly in the last 40 years, there have been tremendous numbers of splits. They resolve some problems. They complicate life in other ways. There have also been a number of things getting in because of lax biosecurity. There have been plenty of things getting in under their own steam, and they seem to be doing so year on year. We know this about climate change, we're going to see the fauna changing, and we are continuing to see so. Let's think a little bit. I've already touched on the fact that hoverflies, um, the adult fly is the thing that you see. It's bright. Well, we think it's bright. I'm going to show you some that aren't. Um, it has a lifespan of probably no more than three weeks. Most of its life's pretty boring as an egg, as a larva, and as a pupering. And that some of them go through that very quickly, and some of them can take over a year to do that. However, it's those larval stages that are really important. 
They are the ones that go out and do things, and they're the things that we use to interpret the role of hoverflies within the wider environment. So what do they do? Well, most people will associate hoverflies as bright, striky yellow and black jobs, of which there are good numbers. You will also be told they're the gardener's friend, they eat aphids. And they do. Only some of them do. So about 37% of the British species actually eat aphids. The rest of them do something else. So you've got something in the region of 160 species, 170 species, that are doing something different. Just starting with the aphidophagues, well, they're pretty impressive things. Remember, these are blind. They don't have vision. They're finding aphids simply by chemosensory and touch. And once they find them, there they go, they're a voracious predator, um, spear the aphid. These are on the underside of leaves, so what you're seeing here is actually the underside of a leaf with the hoverfly larvae rearing up, holding an aphid. And the aphid's got absolutely no chance of getting away. It's speared, it's going to have its innards removed by the hoverfly. Something out of Doctor Who, I think. Um, why does the hoverfly larva actually lift the aphid off the leaf? Well, we think that's something to do with um, pheromones released, um, released by the aphids themselves. So, as a hoverfly that wants to eat lots and lots of aphids, the last thing you want to do is upset the aphid colony and they will run away. You want to be able, once you've found your aphid colony, you can go through and pick the whole lot off. But they don't just eat aphids, they will eat a variety of other things. Um, smaller numbers of species actually act as uh, predators on things like microleptopter caterpillars and on leaf beetle larvae. Once you know what they do, you can find them. And for example, the larvae on leaf beetles of Parasurfus nigritarsis, this thing on the right hand side here, um, it was once thought to be an incredibly rare species. Once we knew what the larvae did, you go out and look for the larvae, and they were much, much more abundant. Some of them like antitended root aphids. Now, if you lift a plant up, classic one, I lifted a load of dandelions out of my allotment. It tells you how often I do my allotment. I had some nice big dandelions. Lift them up, and there are lots and lots of root aphids on the dandelions. Ants will tend those aphids. And we think, in fact we know, that there are a range of hoverfly larvae that actually go for these antitended root aphids. What we don't know is quite which species of ant they're associated with, and precisely how they actually manage themselves, because, because the ants do not want the hoverflies eating their dinner, because the, the ants are busy taking um, uh, sugars from, from, the, uh, from the aphids. But, as I've said, most of the activity in hoverflies is not really uh, aphid driven, it's largely in a number of other um, domains. Good many of them are plant feeders. Um, one particular genus doesn't really look like a hoverfly, does it? It's a black job. You, the numbers of people that go out and photograph hoverflies, they don't come back with these little black jobs because they don't recognise them. But substantial numbers, 37 species in the genus Kylosia, all of them do some quite interesting things. You know the plant they're associated with, again, with any luck, you can find the larvae. One of the ways of finding larvae is to start looking for the host plant. Now, thistles are something that hoverflies love. And in fact, in America, some species of hoverfly have actually been brought in specifically to try and deal with uh, thistle problems. Um, Stuart and I quite regularly travel up to Scotland. And at one time on the maps, you could actually see where we'd been because on a wet day, we'll just drive up every 10 kilometres. We stop, we go and split thistle stems, and we've got records. And these two species are particularly easily recorded from thistle stems. You don't see them very much in the wild as adults. Why? Well, they're out in, November, in March, April, and the weather in March, April is pretty awful, so you don't get many recorders like us going out. But they're there, and sometimes they're in tremendous numbers. <coughs> They'll feed on other things. Um, this example is a thing called Portobinia maculata. It's associated with ramsons. Um, which is wild garlic, 
in the woods around Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire, you should see it, ancient woodlands. Um, the plant itself is one of these things that is a vernal flush species. It comes, um, it emerges very early in the spring, the leaves come up, probably they'll be up by the end of, end of March. By the end of May, the plant will have emerged, flowered, and for the most part, the leaves will be dying off. And the hoverfly times itself absolutely perfectly to the flowering of this, of this, of this plant. I mean, you can be pretty certain, as soon as you find the flowers, go out and look for the hoverfly, and it's there. Now, the interesting thing is, finding the larvae is another matter altogether. And when people started to look for them, they couldn't find them. This hoverfly has the most boring life possible. Eggs are laid, the, the egg, lay, egg emerges as a larva very, very quickly soon after, and the larva does pretty well nothing until the early stages of that vernal flush. When the plant starts to emerge, um, it has to mobilise the sugars in its bulbs, and that's when the hoverfly larva gets feeding. So for no more than a, a matter of five, six weeks, the hoverfly larva is busy feeding in the bulb of the, of the ramsons. It's got a couple of weeks uh, as a puparium, and out it comes. The rest of its time, it's just sitting there doing very little. I told you some of them could have very boring lives. Other examples, well, gardeners love hoverflies, except they don't. Um, if you ever mention uh, Meridon equestris in a forum, you will always get someone coming out and getting very, very hot under the collar about Meridon. It's a lovely thing, it's a bee mimic, it has many, many uh, colour forms. Um, no one's really actually got on top of the colour forms and been able to describe them, they vary so much. It's a species that's essentially European and came into the UK in the bulb trade in the 19th century. And actually, quite interestingly, that the leading entomologist or leading dipterist of the late 19th century commented that the first time he saw it was in his brother's garden in Denmark Hill, and his brother had been importing bulbs from Holland. The Dutch are a real problem of bio biosecurity. They do it today, and I'll come back to that. So, Meridon, it's one of those things that actually goes into um, large bulbs, into daffodils and tulips. Now, if you go to southern Europe, the genus Meridon becomes incredibly radiated. And why? Because in those dry, arid environments, geophytes are actually very abundant. So you get tremendous radiation in Meridon once you get further, north, further south. Northern species, they're in very low numbers. Leaf mining, well, there aren't that many leaf mining hoverflies, certainly in Britain, and not that many in Europe. But there are some quite nice stories associated with it. Kylosia semifasciata is a very odd thing. It, um, it, it mines the leaves mainly of wall pennywort. Now, wall pennywort is a very common plant in, in Western England. You'll find it draping walls all over the place. But for some curious reason, the hoverfly is almost entirely confined to North Wales. And even when you find umbilicus, you can't necessarily find the hoverfly. It requires incredibly uh, well-defined um, humidity environments, probably in places where the wall penny works actually a little bit shaded. It means that the plant survives a little bit longer, and therefore the hoverfly has enough time to go through its um, uh, larval development. Now, one leaf is not enough for a hoverfly larva to, to grow. This, this fly is that size, and the leaf is only that size, so it's going, the larva is going to want to go through three or four leaves. And it has a nice little story associated with it. These blisters caused by the, the larva, once the larva's vacated and the leaf has started to die, would be very, very obvious to uh, particularly bird predators. So as the larva exits the leaf, it crawls underneath and chops the leaf off so that no one can see where it's been. So that's quite a nice little story to tell. The other one is house leeks uh, and Kylosia kerulescens. Now, this is classic bad biosecurity. Back in the early 2000s, Stuart and I were at a conference in Leiden, and our Dutch colleagues were saying, Kylosia um, uh, kerulescens, 
has become incredibly abundant in Holland. It's an alpine species. You wouldn't expect it in Holland, but because it's associated with house leeks that are alpine, um, it's become very widespread in Holland. They said, watch out, it'll get to you at some point. And lo and behold, the Dutch exported it to us. It's come to us. It's, again, one of these urban species. And interestingly, it's one that dipteries don't turn up. The people that turn it up are the people that go out and photograph all the animals in their garden. And we see lots and lots of photographs of Kylosia carolescens. I've actually never knowingly seen it. I've found the larvae. And there, that was a sad story. My mother wanted house leeks in her garden. She was absolutely delighted when she eventually got them established. And then I looked down and I saw <laughs> they were being absolutely wrecked by Kylosia carolescens. So I've got records of larvae from my mother's garden. I'm still to find the adult. But we go on a little bit. Now, obviously, we've gone through predators. We've gone through um, plant uh, associates. But they will do all sorts of other things. And rot is a great material. Have you come across the term saproxylic? No. Blank faces. Saproxylic is something to become aware of. They are animals and fungi that break down wood. And there's a relationship between the two. And saproxylic species are often very, very good indicators of older habitats. Well, that's true with hoverflies. Um, there's a pretty large guild of hoverflies that will associate with rotting wood. Um, the larvae are actually feeding mainly on fungal mycelia. They're not feeding on the wood itself. They burrow into decaying wood. They may well also be filter feeders within the morass. When wood forms two forms of rot, dry or very wet rot. And hoverfly larvae go into the wet rot. Beetle larvae go into dry rot. Um, so there's a whole range of them that will go in there. Most of them are actually underground. So you don't see a lot of the dead wood. Most of it's a metre or so un underground. The larvae go in and they'll be feeding for many, many years in that, that resource. Chop a tree down and you've got sacrosylic habitat for a long, long while. Unless the council comes along with a stump, stump grinder. Nasty things, stump grinders. They should be banned. Other things associated with trees. Well, trees produce sap runs. And what happens to create a sap run is very often associated with the sort of twisting, shaking process that trees undergo. Bad storms, they'll cause damage. Very often the damage doesn't last, but it will lead to sap uh, bubbling out at the surface. Um, Horse chestnuts are a very good example of producing sap runs. There, there seems to be a process where there's a small amount of damage. It gets um, uh, bacterial in, uh, infestation that causes the, the, the damage to continue, and you get long runs of sap. Now, that sap then starts to ferment. Uh, it fills up with, with yeasts and bacteria, and there's a whole range of filter feeders that go into it. And needless to say, there's hoverflies that will... Uh, make use of that. Um, some of these hoverflies are really rather nice because you can actually get them to appear by just scraping the, the sap. That releases all sorts of pheromones and the male, particularly of this thing called Brachioprin sensilis, will appear almost magically outside the sap run. They are delightful. They're also remarkably able to cope with uh, desiccation. So these are the sort of things that can almost come back to life because Sap runs dry up as the season goes on. Hoverfly larva sits there, waits until the next sap run starts working, and then they take over again. Going from sap to rotting vegetable matter is a small jump in that respect. What we're then talking about is, again, animals that are filter feeding on the processes of decay. They're not actually causing the decay. They are making use of it. And there's not much difference, really, between a large cow pad and a compost heap or a silage pad. So you find that there's a whole range of things that will actually occur in, uh, in these sorts of wet, rotting material uh, environments. The two that we've given here are, are quite nice. Ringia campestris, this thing at the top, uh, has the most incredible proboscis, which is held in the extended uh, mouth edge 
If I said to you the Heineken fly, would anyone recognise Heineken? Would you remember the... No, you wouldn't. There used to be a lovely ad advert about Heineken, the beer that gets to places that other beers don't reach. Well, this is the fly that gets to, to flowers that other flowers can't reach, hence the Heineken fly. Rot holes. Well, once a tree has damage, then you get a process of rot, and if you're very lucky, you end up with uh, private swimming pools for hoverflies. Not all species of tree will produce rots. Um, things like horse chestnut, lime, sycamore uh, will produce wet rots. Oaks and sweet chestnuts will produce very dry rots. So if you talk to a dipterist, we're always looking at woodlands that have wet rots in them. And the coleopterists are always looking at woodlands which have very dry rot. And it's quite a fundamental difference. Why? Well, fly larvae have very, very poor um, uh, abilities to avoid desiccation. So they need a wet environment. So they can't cope with sort of dry red rot of, of oak, but they can cope with a private swimming pool, um, which is absolutely ideal for some of these uh, rather wonderful things. They're, they're, they're often tremendous acute hymenoptera mimics. And how do they do it? Well, they sit in their private swimming pool. They've got a long tail. Um, they sit down there in this nasty, smelly, sulfur-rich environment that takes probably a couple of years to actually uh, for the larva to develop. Um, they stick the tail up to the, the surface. Um, the top of the uh, um, um, spiracle has water uh, reject uh, water. Um, a ring of hairs that prevents water coming in. Brain's not working. Some of these things have the most remarkable uh, um, spiracles. This is, this is Myothrope fluoria, a very common thing. Um, the actual um, spiracles are actually quite uh, anything upwards of 10, 12 centimetres long. They're dead easy to, 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 to breed up. Uh, they'll go into virtually any rotting environment with a mixture of um, uh, rotting leaves and rotting twigs, um, and very, very widespread indeed. So that they can even be used in educational purposes, this is, uh, this is a hoverfly uh, a nest box. Um, very, very simple, um, Pepsi can or a pe Pepsi bottle or something like that, cut a hole in the side, attach it to a, uh, a tree on the north side so that it doesn't heat up and get too, too hot and too dry. Um, fill, fill it with water and within a very short time the hoverflies will be coming in. And you can actually watch the larvae moving around the, the, the bottle. Um, another example, Aristalis tenax, um, uh, the classic rat-tailed maggot. Um, again, very long uh, spiracles um, and, and a thing that will actually occur in uh, some of the most disgusting environments. I think, Stuart, you, you described seeing whole cow shed sides covered in these things, didn't you? Yeah, the, um, the um, slurry pit that the farmer pushes the dung from the cow shed into uh, is very good for the larvae, but the larvae, mature larva, comes out to pupate, so they all crawl up the side mm. of the wall of the barn, and you get the whole wall plastered with pupal exuvia. Yeah. And um, sewage farms, for example, can breed yeah. these things by the million. Yeah. Uh, huge numbers. Yeah. So move on a little bit. That's a really uh, nutrient-enriched environment, many more wetlands, and, of course, there are plenty of wetland hoverflies that use very, very similar techniques. These are often actually within the leaf sheaths of wetland plants rather than uh, burrowing down into the mud. But there's a whole, whole range of, of, of species at different levels within the water column. And including some rather neat little stories. Uh, if you're under, underwater, you obviously need to breathe. You can do it firstly by putting a breathing tube up to the surface. Uh, the other way you can do it is to plug into the plant's own systems. Plants need to get oxygen down to the roots. They have a series of air cavities in their, in, their, uh, uh, in their stems. And these things actually plug in to the air cavities. So they just sit there, plugged into the air at one end, filter feeding at the other, pretty as safe as houses. 
Move on a little bit. Um, some of our most spectacular hoverflies are associated with bee and wasp nests. And we've got four species, all illustrated here, three of which, they're in bee and wasp nests, but they're actually acting as scavengers at the bottom of the nest. Just the one, uh, Volicella inanis, where the larva does actually appear to be predaceous. And then my favourite, these again are out of Doctor Who, um, Microdon. Now, Microdon in some cases is actually split off as a separate family, but we certainly keep it within the Surfidae in Britain, um, and they're well worth looking at. They tell some very nice stories. The first thing is, if you're going to live in an ant's nest, ants are pretty nasty animals. They don't like anyone getting into their nest. Um, if you've ever gone near a red, red wood ant's nest, you'll find that you get bitten quite rapidly if you're in the wrong place. So if you're a hoverfly larva, you really don't want to get bitten. It's not going to do you any good. And these things are actually built like armoured tanks. Um, heavily uh, armoured uh, outer surface, a fringe of hairs around the, uh, the base of the hoverfly where all the, um, uh, the, 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 the delicate parts are, um, and an ability to clamp itself onto the substrate. In this case, blackwood ants, uh, well, these are laziest niger, in a pine stump. They clamp themselves down, wander around the nest, and come out again. This is, this is just sci-fi. The head comes out from between these hairs, grabs an ant larva, back inside, eats the ant larva, but cleverly, it's absorbing the ant's pheromones in the process. So the more the larvae eat ant larvae, the more they actually mimic the ant larvae themselves, because they're exhibiting the same ant pheromones. And this is absolutely essential for them to actually get back into the ant nests um, as young larvae. In that case, the, the, the female microdon actually impregnates the egg chorion, in other words, the shell of the egg, uh, with ant pheromones, lays the eggs very, very close to the ant's nest. Usually the ants have a uh, a, a deposit ground for waste material from the nest, so they'll, they'll um, lay eggs in that sort of area. The triangulum larvae, which is a very mobile larva, then finds its way back into the ant nest, having eaten the egg chorion first and absorbed the ant's pheromones. So they can get into the ant nest because they're, they're tricking the ants. Now, there's some quite interesting stuff here because ants have... Uh, a lot of variety in uh, the pheromone content of their uh, of individual con uh, colonies. So as colonies separate, they can actually tell each other apart by very slight differences in uh, the chemical traces. And this means that if you're a hoverfly larva that's trying to um, imitate your host, you, don't, you probably don't want to go too far from your host because if you try a new ant nest, your pheromones may not be quite what that ant was expecting and your larva won't get in. And there's some quite nice evidence to show that as the further away from ant colonies uh, uh, some species of microdon get, the less likely they are to get into the ant nest. Uh, now conversely, there are the, <laughs> the ones that actually do the opposite and we, we do see species that actually have a greater chance further away. Now quite how that works, we don't know yet. So there's a lot to be done there. And in conservation terms, this is really quite important because what we're seeing in many places is effectively subspeciation. Each microdon is associated with a super colony of ants. If you wipe out the super colony of ants, you've wiped out the microdon. And the microdon can't necessarily move. And also, if you want to have re-establishment re programs, there's no guarantee that even if you try to re-establish that the microdon can get in. Now, hopefully, I've convinced one or two of you, you might have a go at hoverflies. Um, and in which case, you need to know how to identify them. Which is where Stuart and I certainly came in. Um, you can buy a popular field guide by Paul and Morris. It will get you started. Um, it's not everything, but it's a pretty good start, and most people like to start these days by familiarising themselves 
and then moving on to proper keys. And you can move on to proper keys. Um, the standard work, Alan Stubbs and Stephen Falk, this was what really got me into Hoverflies back in 1983. Um, we hope that our book will do the same with the new generation, but there is still Stubbs and Falk, and it is essential. A lot of these things can only be identified through micros microscopy. So, yes, you can do quite a lot in the same standard way as birders do, look at the pictures, and, oh, yes, I've got such and such. But in actual fact, if you really want to get into them, for a lot of them, you've got to look at microscopic characters. Now, the UK key is fine, but there are quite a number of species in Europe that could get into the UK. And what we do find is when our European friends come over, the numbers of times that they add new species to the British list because they know what they're looking for, we don't. So it's always useful to have uh, a copy of Van Veen, the hoverflies in Northern Europe. Um, and certainly, those of us that have spent any time with hoverflies, it'll be on all our shelves. Very essential. Larvae, well, there's quite a lot of interest in larvae. Um, Graham Rothery produced this lovely guide uh, back in 1993. It is available still, and you can download it from the Dipterus Forum website. And I'll digress here. We need new recruits to Dipterus Forum. Do please join. Um, it's a great way of actually getting mentoring um, and taking part in uh, a variety of activities that will develop your abilities as a Dipterist. Um, move on a little bit further. A lot of people need a bit of help to get started. Now, when Stuart and I started, we, we, we were pretty well self-taught. There wasn't the facility to teach people. Stuart and I, uh, over the years, have developed quite a comprehensive series of courses. We do ones on hoverflies, we do um, larger brachycera, we do uh, diptera families, and we will quite happily travel the country. We have a set of teaching microscopes, so we fill the car with microscopes, fill the car with specimens, so we've got virtually a museum with microscopes, travel around the country, uh, and we'll, we'll run courses. So if anyone here is thinking, well, I'd quite like to do something like that, there are two possibilities. Keep your eyes open for courses advertised, or talk to your local wildlife trust and get them to get in contact with us, and we'll come and run a course. And we, some years we've run eight or nine in a year. These days we've cut down a bit, and we'll do three or four. Um, recording, we're going to move now slowly, quickly, into records and what you can do with them. And I'll pass over to Stuart at that point. The recording scheme, as I said, Stuart and I have run it for 26, 27 years. Um, we are gradually growing the team. And the idea being, we will take a back seat and the new team will take over. And we're hoping it's going to be seamless, but at the moment we haven't got quite the new team in place yet. Could be you. Um, so... What have we got with the recording scheme? Well, we've got quite good coverage there, haven't we? And we've just reached a million records. Now, there aren't many invertebrate recording schemes that have got anywhere near a million records. Yes, dragonflies. Yes, butterflies. Yes, moths. Bees, ants and wasps haven't. And yet they're the ones that always seem to be popular. Hoverflies, we've hit a million this year. And we're very pleased about that. Why have we hit a million? Well, partly it's just down to the fact that we've been going for a long while. But we do have a very active uh, community of recorders these days, uh, which is largely based around our Facebook page. So take a look at the Facebook page, UK Hoverflies. You'll be very welcome. Um, it's one of our ways of actually mentoring people. So if you don't manage to get on courses, but you still want to take an interest, take a look at the Facebook page. We also have a sister page, UK Hoverfly Larvae, which is really geared towards encouraging people to look at larval stages. And Graham Rothery, who wrote the larval book, his daughter now runs that page. She's based with Dave Goulson down in University of Sussex. Give you an idea about records per year. This, this tells quite an interesting story. Um, the scheme started in 1976. 
at that time there were probably only 10 to 20 people that were, committing, were submitting records on a regular basis. In 1983, Alan Stubbs's um, book first came out, so this would be about here, and as you can see, it obviously stimulated quite a lot of interest. Now, you don't keep that interest going unless you're doing something, and recording schemes only have um, interest if they're not only doing something, they're feeding back. And what you see with the graph is very much, as we see relatively little feedback, things tail off. We get a little bit more of a spike as we produce or go towards producing an atlas. And in fact, we produced our first atlas here in 2000. Um, we got a spike there because we did a call for records. We got a drop there because we were busy entering records and, um, uh, and, and, and not really pushing anything. Um, and then when the atlas came out, things just gently eased off. What we now see is around about 2005, we decided we had to do something like a new atlas, and that started to stimulate things. At that time, we also started running regular training courses and not just the ones we run for the Field Studies Council. Um, and that certainly made quite a lot of difference over the period to 2011. But the big jump has really been 2013, we set up the Facebook group and it's gone crazy. So it tells you a little bit about the way the world has moved. 30 years ago, you would have joined the Natural History Society, that would have been the way that you would have got into these sorts of things. These days, you join the social media, and it's, a, it's immediate, you get a response almost uh, by the click of a button. And it works in terms of developing recording. And that tells us quite a lot in terms of the sources of data. Um, when we first started, a lot of data was on cards, and I spent five years entering data from cards. We inherited two cubic metres of record cards. I think I deserved to be put amongst the little men with the white coats at times. We also saw, at that time, the major recorders using databases such as MapMate and Recorder. That's gone. What we now see is most people using their own spreadsheets, and increasingly the number of people who post photographs on Facebook and either keep their own spreadsheets or more often than not I extract the data directly from Facebook. It's a never ending job but it has paid div dividends. And as you can see the same dividends show in terms of the numbers of recorders. Now trying to work out what a recorder is is very difficult. We've got over 8,000 names on the data set but of those an awful lot of them will have contributed one or two records. I don't regard that as a recorder. So there are two ways perhaps of establishing who a recorder is. Um, the first graph uh, being someone who's submitted uh, five records on at least three occasions, gives you an idea that they're doing something consistently. And again, you can see that the real growth started around about 2005, and that would coincide with the time when we were most started to be particularly active running training courses. If you start to look the same at um, the numbers of people who've recorded or submitted over 250 records, the numbers are much smaller, but again, you get much the same sort of pattern. Tells you a bit of a story. If you are going to run a recording scheme, you have to engage. You can't just wait for people to come to you. It's the story of life. If you want to do something, don't wait for someone else to organise it. Go and do it yourself. Um, I'll finish with just giving you a few thoughts as to where the research potential might be. Um, lots and lots of interest in pollinators. Some of you may be thinking about a PhD. Maybe you'll be looking at opportunities there. There's an awful lot of species ecology to do. Occasionally PhDs come up in species ecology. Perhaps as we start to ask questions about why the fauna of Britain and the fauna of Europe is collapsing, there will be more. We already know that we can use hoverflies as indicators of the country, countryside. If you think about that huge range of, um, of, of biology, you can use that quite nicely to tell us something about what's occurring within particular parts of the landscape. 
Landscape connectivity. I, I think there's a lot to be done there with mark release re recapture. That's just been touched. There's a long way to go. And climate change indicators. Well, climate change is very much on everyone's lips at the moment. Hoverflies are showing lots and lots of signs of indication uh, of, 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 of change, and that's something that Stuart's going to talk about. So I shall, I think, pass it over to Stuart. Okay, well, if you want to know about um, how things are changing, then um, obviously the, the best thing to do is sample, system, sample systematically. Um, so if you can apply the same method of sampling fauna and flora, apply it repeatedly at the same sites over a long period of time, then you get good statistically robust data to show that things have changed. Um, our problem is there are rather few examples that actually do this. Things like the uh, British Trust for Ornithology's various schemes, butterfly monitoring scheme, the Rothamsted uh, light traps, the Rothamsted insect survey, and then a uh, few others like the Seabird Monitoring Program, the Trapping, Trapping Mammals Partnership, um, that are trying to produce and have these long-term data sets. Um, there are very few of these and we really struggle to keep them going. I mean, keeping the funding going and things is a real uh, problem. Um, on the other hand, we have um, lots of biological recording, sort of ad hoc collection of records for particular groups. The um, Biological Record Centre lists more than 80 national recording schemes. Um, they cover about 12,500 uh, terrestrial and freshwater species. Now, I estimate the sort of freshwater uh, macro fauna, the terrestrial and freshwater uh, macro fauna in Britain is about 50,000 species if you leave out the bacteria and viruses and things. So, even so, that's only about a quarter of the total British species. But many of these schemes have long runs of data. Um, Organised recording really kicked off in the 1970s. There was a big push to establish schemes and so on. And the data is increasingly uh, available. The NBN Gateway, now the NBN Atlas, makes this readily available. Uh, and uh, it's up to 216 million records now on there. So you can get a hold of this data. Uh, the big problem in using it to try and uh, look at changes is the... Um, are you actually looking at the change in species or are you looking at the changes in recording effort? Um, it is confounded by changes in recording effort and that's quite tricky. Actually quantifying that recording effort is difficult and therefore correcting for both the temporal and geographical variation is quite tricky. And there's been a lot of effort to try and find methods to sort of correct for that to actually get the signal out of the data. Uh, and I list a whole series of uh, publications and steps there that have come out. Um, currently, people working at CEH at Wallingford, uh, particularly uh, Nick Isaacs and um, uh, Mark Powney, Gary Powney, Gary uh, are doing lots of stuff with complicated general linear models and so on, and there's plenty of literature coming out uh, along these uh, efforts. I got involved much earlier on with the Hoverfly Atlas and so on. So if we take um, a simple couple of methods to give you a flavour of it, uh, very straightforwardly, this is the number of unique records that have been um, uh, contributed to the Hoverfly recording scheme in a series of years. A unique record is a unique combination of date, uh, grid reference, the spatial reference where the thing comes from, and the species name. I go for unique records because we have a degree of problem with duplication in the recording scheme. So uh, Fred Bloggs gives us his records, he also sends them to the local record centre, and he also publishes them in the local County Wildlife Trust bulletin. And so we potentially pick up that record from three different sources, directly from him, from the local record centre and by uh, digitising the publication. Uh, but it's only one record, so you deal with that by looking at unique records. Of those unique records, these are the number we've received of this particular beastie, Christ Stops and Corton. And if you take the proportion of all records, 
then uh, this is what um, you get in the way of a trend with the um, confidence, uh, with the error bars there showing 95% confidence interval of proportion. Now, on the basic assumption that we know um, our recording efforts is biased, most of the population in Britain lives in the southeast, and in general, um, the entomologists follow the general population. There's this small, rather peculiar band of people who like collecting insects, and they're a very small part towards the population. So most of them tend to be where most people live, and there are rather few of them in the sparsely populated areas in the north and west of Britain. But assuming that that bias is fairly consistent, that that hasn't changed over that time period, and that most people have lived in the southeast, and the proportion of peculiar people who go out developing uh, recording insects hasn't changed very much, um, we can assume that over a large number of records that sort of thing evens out. Now, a slightly more complicated way of doing this was developed by Mark Hill, who was the head of the Biological Records Centre for a long time. He published it in 2012. He called it Frescalo. Uh, and what, instead of using the total number of records as a measure of recording effort, he quantified uh, the proportion of the really commonest species that were recorded in what he called a neighbourhood. If we take our target in this case 10 kilometres square, its neighbourhood is similar squares that are nearby and have similar environmental conditions. And the environmental conditions can be um, defined in terms of things like land cover and climate. And the similarity of these squares is expressed as a weight. And obviously the closer the square is, the more similar it is, the greater the weight. So if you take all the species that have been uh, recorded in that neighbourhood, and uh, you uh, calculate their frequency weighted by the similarity of the square, you get a weighted relative frequency of that species. Now, you would expect the commonest species to be recorded. Uh, if there are 20 common species and all 20 of them have been recorded, then you're probably dealing with a well-recorded square. If only five of them have been recorded, then you probably there hasn't been much recording effort. So that's a way of correcting for it. Um, and this uh, works well, particularly for 10 kilometer square data, which is the most readily available. Um, so it's actually, uh, I quite like using this because uh, most of the data can be quantified at that spatial resolution. This shows similar sort of thing, dealing with um, uh, what cal uh, Frescalo calculates, which uh, Mark Hill calls the T factor, it's a weighted relative frequency of, of the species. And in this case, the error bars show its standard deviation. Now, how do we make that into a trend? Um, well, this is a method that was suggested by uh, a guy called Theo Ziegler, who produced the Dutch hoverfly atlas, and he used Spearman's rank correlation. So we rank the years and we rank the, uh, the relative frequencies and look at their correlation. What we're actually looking at is, is there a tendency for the lower proportions to come later in the sequence? If so, then that suggests a decline in frequency relative to the recording effort of that species. Um, so taking, this is the proportional, this is the Frescalo uh, thing, a straightforward linear trend line and the calculated Spearman's rank correlation. And in both cases you can see there is a significant tendency for that frequency corrected for recording effort to decline over the period. So we think this species is showing a tendency to decline over that time period. Um, if you're dealing with multiple species, then obviously the relative frequency of species varies considerably from one species to another. Um, but if you want to express them on the same scale, so you can actually compare them and combine them in some way, the, the method that has been developed, and this is used by things like the Butterfly Monitoring Scheme and the Breeding Bird Survey, is to fit a smooth curve through these, um, um, through these points, 
um, uh, a smoothing spline and to take uh, an initial value usually at the start of your recording period and call that arbitrarily 100 and then divide the, um, the fitted value from that smoothed curve for each of the subsequent years and then you get an index that's relative to 100. Um, so in this case 100 is 1994 and this is the, uh, the, VAT, the amount of um, um, the, the fitted smooth curve here and expressed as um, a proportion of that 100 in 1994. So curlews in Wales have shown a decline, black caps across the UK have shown quite an increase and nightingales in England uh, are, are on the way down. This is breeding bird survey uh, results. Um, you can fit a confidence interval around these using bootstrapping, bootstrapping techniques and you can see that the confidence interval for black caps is very narrow because presumably there's an awful lot of records of black cap coming in. Here's the same thing done for the, for the two methods for this hoverfly. Um, smoothing spline fitted through it. Um, each year expressed as a proportion of 100 in 1980 and then we can put these two different methods, the proportional method and the t-factor method, on the same axis. And we can see that we get similar sorts of results, except really that this one turns up rather more um, in the, uh, um, at the end of that sequence. Um, so we see across the holofly some species declining. Um, these are pretty typical of uh, wetland species. We see a lot of species declining there. Uh, this is a fairly typical pattern. Surprisingly, we also see a lot of species which tend to eat conifer aphids, showing strong decline. That's another well-declined group. It's not all declines. Here's a couple of species that have shown massive increases. Um, this species, Rigia rostrata, was a species that was considered very rare. And when an insect red data book was produced in um, 1979, 89. 89 it was published, this was actually classed as vulnerable red data book category two. And you can see before 1990, it was known from the weald of sort of Sussex and a few places in South Wales, particularly the Forest of Dean. Then around about 2000, it started extending up the Welsh borders. And by about 2005, it had been found in uh, our area around um, Bedfordshire and uh, Northamptonshire and Cambridgeshire. Um, and it's now got as far north as sort of Lancaster and Silverdale Arnside area. Um, and it's just massively expanded. And we have no idea at all why that's happened, why this species has taken off. But it's gone from being a real rarity to now being a common species over the whole southern half of Great Britain. Bonicella zanari is interesting. This is very much a, a, a Mediterranean species, uh, known as the hornet hoverfly. As Roger said earlier, the larvae live in wasps' nests where they're scavengers in the base of the nests, sort of eating dropped food and dead workers and that sort of thing. Um, up until the Second World War, this was the great prize of British Diptera. There had been, I think it was six records up to 1939, and it was every Dictress dream to find this thing, because it's big and beautifully colourful and so on. Then, in, after the Second World War, in the sort of 50s and into the early 60s, it settled largely in the London area and started breeding. And there's absolutely enormous literature. Um, um, this was all documented. Everybody who found the thing published it. And you can look at these publications still go into the Natural History Museum and actually see the specimens that they were writing papers about. It managed to hang on through the, uh, the 60s when we had some really cold winters, although it didn't do particularly well. And through the sort of 80s and 90s, it was in particularly the London basin. There was a small colony in Bristol and it occurred along the south coast in some years. Then about 1995, it sort of took off and it started becoming commoner. And since then, it's spread and spread and spread. And I think this is an urban heat island species. It was, it was managing to live in the London uh, basin because 
the urban area raised the temperature slightly. By the 1995, warming had happened enough for it to escape that Healy Island and spread. And last year we had um, one record from North Yorkshire, yeah. and we've had records as far up again as, uh, as the Southern Lakes now. No, 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 no. it's all the way first now. South. Sorry, yes, there's one up here. Yeah. Just south of the Solway. <laughs> so it's nearly um, Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> I predicted this thing would get to Scotland by 2020, um, and I think I'm going to be right. I think that model was a good one, wasn't it? Yeah. If yeah. anyone wants to see the model, it's, it's in a paper that's uh, available. Yeah. So if you put this lot together, you can obviously count the number of species that show a significant up or down. You get a fair proportion that show no significant change. And if you do this for hoverflies, just over half show a significant downward trend. Now that's pretty typical. This has been done for a series of uh, insect groups. Um, for example, for the macro moths, it's something like 60%, something close to two thirds show a decline. Um, for things like the ants, bees, and wasps, it's uh, well over a half. Um, things like water beetles and ground beetles, this would be a typical result for. So in many groups, have shown this decline. And if we take our um, our fitted splines and turn them into index values. We can then combine those index values and because these are proportions, the appropriate statistic is a geometrical mean, not an arithmetic mean. <coughs> so you multiply the proportions together and then take the nth root where n is the number of the, the ones you're combining. And you can see we get this tendency for um, the relative frequency with which we're finding hoverflies relative to a certain amount of recording effort to be in decline. We are finding less hoverflies. And this anecdotally fits in our experience of running field trips and so on. You now really struggle to find this sort of stuff when you go out in the countryside very often. There was Nirvana 30 years ago when they were just so common. So, to go through um, a case where you can see the sort of things you can do, this is a particular species, Leucozona glaucia. Um, it's a nice one because it's very easy to identify. Um, it's a popular one with photographers. It comes in the top 30 species uh, we get photographs of. So, we get lots of records of it. Um, this is the relative uh, frequency uh, trend. You can see there is no obvious sign of increase or decline. It's a non-significant, fairly flat one. But if we look at the distribution before 1990 compared with 2005 on, the immediate thing that I noticed made me pursue this is you've got this big block of records here, and yet very few records in this area in this bit. And also, it's a bit sparse up here, but there's quite a lot of records in this later period. Now, this isn't recording effort. This is the best recorded part of Britain, really, the southeast where most entomologists are, and certainly where most photographers are. And if anything, there was more recording in Scotland, in that, uh, particularly in the 1980s, because there was an active Scottish recording scheme then, than there has been recently. So this is unlikely to be because, if anything, there's been less recording here in that period than there was in that period. So it's not likely to be a recording effort thing. So what can we do with the recording scheme data to investigate that? Well, the first thing we can do is look at the actual raw observations. So this is the 10 kilometer squares for various time slices. And we can do something uh, about fitting a polygon around these observations. And there's a class of polygons called alpha holes. An alpha hole tries to fit a shape that is um, a tight or, or looser fit, depending on a value alpha. And I usually use a value of alpha of around about 50 kilometers, which will, uh, if you've got more than a 50 kilometer gap in the distribution, it'll break into more than one polygon. So if you take the areas of these polygons, you can see, if anything, the um, area has increased. So we're not seeing a, a, um, a, a drop in the range of the species. But if you take the centroid of those polygons, so if you think of cutting the polygon out in cardboard and balancing them on the pin, the centroid is where the polygon would balance. 
And if you take that, the track of that centroid is definitely showing a northwestward trend. We're seemingly seeing a northwestward shift in the distribution of this species. If we go back to our frescalo, our rescaled frequency, for a particular period you can rescale the frequency of, of finding these things, uh, scaled according to the recording effort, and again you can see pretty frequent down here, quite a gap in the distribution up here, and in the later period much sparser down here and quite a lot up there. So red is where there's been a decline, green is where there's been an increase. Again, evidence for a northwestward shift in the distribution. Another way we can tackle it is species distribution models. Now the idea of a species distribution model is you take the known distribution, you take um, relevant environmental parameters like um, topography and weather and soil conditions and so on, and you develop some sort of a model which says these are the con I, I will try and find out what the conditions are like where that species is observed by taking these known points of presence and the environmental parameters at those points of presence from the map. You can then ask the model if we go back and look at these maps where else are those sorts of conditions likely to occur and come up with a potential distribution the sorts of places that provide the environmental conditions at these points of presence and therefore the species is likely to be at. Now, environmental layers, um, we've got things like land cover. We now have data available from the European Space Agency. Uh, land cover at, at um, um, uh, 300 metre resolution, um, on a time series at the moment from 1992 to 2015. So this is the proportion of one kilometre squares covered in broad-leaved um, um, woodland according to the, um, uh, the land cover data. We've got weather observation. This is observed weather station data from the Met Office which has been interpolated onto the uh, UK grid. It's available from uh, in the case of some of the variables right back to about the um, late 19th century but in all the variables from 1960 onwards uh, at the moment up to 2017 is so far available and it includes things like rainfall, minimum maximum temperatures, hours of sunshine, wind direction, days of frost, all sorts of things. So here's the total rainfall um, and you can see highest in the northwest, lowest in uh, East Anglia. We've got digital elevation model from the NASA 2000 shuttle mission. This measured the height of the ground every 30 metres across the entire planet. Um, available freely to download, although it's an enormous download from the NASA site. From that you can do things like what's the mean elevation in each kilometre square. Um, how many, how, what area of slope is facing southwards, how much sun southeast aspect is there in each one kilometre square, um, aspects of topography like that. And then there's the European Soils Database, uh, which gives you things like, uh, this is the dominant soil class in each one kilometre square. Uh, also things like how much sandy soil, how much well-draining soil, how much uh, waterlogged soil there is in each one kilometre square. And the map modelling system I've been using mostly is a system called MaxEnt, maximum entropy modelling. Um, so this is then a, a MaxEnt model of a particular species showing some measure of the likelihood occurrence of that species in one kilometre squares where red is high and blue is low. Looks really pretty and uh, uh, great for um, illustrating papers and that sort of thing. They, always, they have a great wow factor. You, you know, if you're trying to present this to policy makers and so on, but they see a map like that, that's real science, you know, that must be right. Um, but is it right? How do you know whether it's um, any good or not? Well, you can take the... Um, the model which gives you some measure of uh, likelihood of occurrence of the species in each one kilometre square. 
and you can turn that into presence absence. This is the, this is the maximum uh, probability in each one kilometer, in each ten kilometer square in Britain, and then I've applied a threshold. So I've said if that probability is greater than 0.5, then I'll say present. If it's less, I'll say absent. And you can compare that with actual observation data. And when you do that, you've got four possibilities. You've got the case where the model predicted it and we observed it. You've got the case where um, we observed it, but the model didn't predict it was going to be there. You've got the case where it's not observed, but the model predicts it ought to be. And finally, we have the case where it's not observed and the model predicted it wasn't going to be anyway. So there's four possible outcomes. We can total up the number of squares in each of those four categories, and we can tabulate them. And that's known as a confusion matrix. So here is our model predicted presence absence, and our observations observed, not observed. And we have the four possible cases which are known as true presence, false negative, false presence, and true negative. And we can do some interesting statistics on this. Um, what's known as the true positive rate, we observed it in 131 squares, and the model successfully predicted 127 out of those. So the true positive rate is 127 over 131 which is 97%. Remember, that's for a particular threshold. We've set a threshold to turn those probabilities into presence and absence at one particular level. Similarly, with false positive, we can say in a sample of 10,000 squares, um, the model predicted uh, it should be present, false presences in a 1,000 of them. Um, of that 10,000, the 1,000 were actually predicted by the model, which is 10% are false um, uh, positives. We can then take those two values and plot them against each other. So here's our false positive rate, and here's our true positive rate, and we can plot 10% against whatever it was, 90 some odd percent. And we can do that for each possible threshold. We can go threshold 1%, 2%, up to 99%, 100%. And that gives you a trace, which is known as a receiver operating characteristic, or rock curve. And you can look at uh, the total area under that curve, which in this case is pretty high. Now, if the model was always right, never wrong, it would look like this. It would go straight up to 100%, and it would stick at 100%. And the area under that curve would be 1. If we flipped a coin, just chance, then we would get this straight diagonal line and the area under the curve would be um, 0.5. And so where this curve comes, how far it pushes into that corner, is a measure of the sort of um, overall fit of that model across the entire range of possible thresholds. Now, this is used considerably in things like um, test, drug testing models and that sort of thing, anything where you get this sort of thing. So the statistics are well developed. And there's a sort of rule of thumb um, that, you know, 0.8 is not bad, 0.85 is a pretty good model, 0.9 for the area under the curve is very good, and if it's 0.95, then you've probably cheated. <laughs> um, so just past cheating. <laughs> so, the way we tend to test these things is train the model with a randomly selected proportion of the data, and if there's plenty of data, I tend to use half of it for fitting the model. Um, we then um, test against the, the withheld proportion of the data. And so, here's the uh, training rock curve and the testing rock curve, and pretty much always your training curve will be better. The data fits better to the data you trained it on, as you would hope that would be the case. But what you, take, um, what you take notice of is this testing curve, the proportion of the data that was randomly withheld. And you can always, you can do multiple runs, you can withheld different random uh, chunks and so on. Um, so, so you actually take account of this testing AUC. And in this particular case, we're just above this 0.85 value, so we would say this is, I would say it's a good model. 
it's, it's working pretty well. So, if we fit our model to two time slices, and I've used the first five years for which the land cover data was available against the last five years for which the land cover data was available. So here's two um, species distribution models. And again, if you take the difference between these two, we see a decrease in the predicted probability in this southeast area and an increase in this northwest area. So again, we're seeing a tendency for this species to have shifted northwestwards during that time period. And perhaps the last way we can look at the data here is to look at the northern edge of the range, where the thing has got to in the north. Now, for species like butterflies, a method has been developed where, in a time period, you look at the end most northerly records, the 10, the 20 most northerly records, and then look at the mean or median um, northern coordinates of those most northerly records. So I've taken 20 most northerly records in a series of time slices, um, 1900 to 1980, the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000 and the 2010s. I've taken the 20 most northerly records and I've taken the median Y coordinates in terms of the OS national grid. And you can see there's been this tendency for that northerly thing to move northwards. And I've shown this background map so you can see roughly where we're talking about. So that first time slice, 1900 to 1980, the median was around about Fort William. And by 2010 to 2017, we're talking of the median being north of Inverness, about a 100 kilometre northward shift in the sort of sub-definition of the northern edge of that range. Now, a lot of hoverflies, we just don't have enough data to go through this procedure for each species. You need pretty good amounts of data in each time slice to do this. But you can do this across a wide range of species. And you can look for this sort of significant trend in northward um, um, boundary. And there's a, um, a whole series of species which produce um, a significant trend on that northern shift of the boundary. So there's a suggestion that this is happening across a wider range of species. But it's certainly been found um, quite widely in European butterflies now, that this northern edge of the uh, uh, north, northward movement of the range. Um, so change is happening, and uh, there's a lot of it out there. So just to uh, conclude about what you can use these sorts of records for, um, if you want to detect change, sample systematically. That's much the best way of doing it. Unfortunately, we don't have many cases of that, and the chances of getting funding to set up new long-term monitoring schemes at the moment is very low. There's been quite an effort to try and establish a, a pollinator monitoring scheme and DEFRA has basically said, OK, we can fund you for three years, but any funding beyond that, maybe, maybe not. There's no commitment to it. So establishing a new long-term scheme, and generally the experience is it takes 10 years of data before you get into statistics. So we can't even get enough funding to produce the sort of minimum you need to to get a statistical significant result. Um, the trends in biological recording are difficult because they're confounded by geographical and temporal variation in recording effort, but there are um, an increasing number of statistical methods trying to tackle this problem. They do have some assumptions, the big assumption being that recorder behaviour may be biased, but it's constantly biased. If the way of recording has changed, then you bust that assumption and you can't expect to get good records. And obviously the big change that's happening is this move to social media, posting everything online and so on, and we are seeing in the hoverflies this is affecting the data coming in. We're getting a lot more records of the common and obvious, and less people doing the more obscure and things that require catching specimens and under a microscope. So a change in recorder behaviour busts those assumptions and causes us a problem. Um, these sorts of methods are only likely to, change, uh, to detect big changes. 
but there are big changes going on out there and we need to detect big changes at the moment. We need to make these, um, document and quantify these obvious changes because, you know, if we, unless we do that, we're not going to affect policy uh, at all, which we're really struggling with. Um, and the calculated trends across a whole series of invertebrate groups suggest a lot more species are declining than increasing. Um, in many cases, more than half the species in big groups are showing declines. Species distribution models are very useful. Um, they are good at filling in sparse data. Now, in Britain, we are quite rich in data, but in a lot of the world, data is very sparse indeed. So these sorts of techniques are, are very important when you're working in many parts of the world. And uh, the UK experience is they work well, they produce models that are sort of good, very good, and so on, for about 40% of the species in the case of things like macrolepidoptera, hoverflies, ants, bees, and wasps that I've actually done this sort of modelling on. So there's lots of useful things you can do, even with this ad hoc collected data. Okay, so that covers what we're intending to say. And, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.